am Despina Severinas and I am a developmental psychologist by training. Um, and so I study road injuries and fatalities. So to sort of set the stage for this topic, Dr. Waterboy already alluded to some of this in my introduction. Uh, road injuries and fatalities, one of the top 10 causes of worldwide deaths for low income through upper middle co income countries. And that's been the case since I started doing this about a decade ago. Here in the United States, leading cause of death for young people in particular, ages five to 24. And it's actually the second leading cause of death for people ages 25 to 44 with opioids or accidental overdoses being the, the top cause now for that particular age group. So here in the United States, we see an average of 100 people dying each day due to road injuries and fatalities. And when we look at the particular mechanism or cause of these injuries in a transportation um, network, you can see here to the right, the majority of these, not surprisingly, are passenger vehicle crashes. Although it's important to know that there are other ways that road injuries and fatalities may occur in transportation. Here we see a fifth are from pedestrians and bicyclists. Motorcycles also account, accounting for 14%. And then the small slice there, large trucks account for about 4%. But when these do occur, they tend to be more severe, uh, more likely to be fatal and cost a lot more. And big news when it happens. <laughs> and big news when it happens, absolutely. And so why is a psychologist up here studying this? Well, when we look at the number one cause of motor vehicle crashes, we know that that is driver behavior. So as a behavioral scientist, I've dedicated my career to understanding the factors that increase crash risk for a variety of populations across the lifespan. And it's particularly important to study that here um, in Alabama, because unfortunately we're on one of the, the top worst states or, of drivers across the United States. And actually the deep South accounts for five of the top 10 worst drivers across the nation. And so here in Alabama, the motor vehicle crash fatality rate is actually nearly double that of the US rate. And that's held pretty constant over the past few years. So in an effort to um, really organize and systematically investigate the risk factors for motor vehicle crashes. In 2009, I established the mouthful, as Dr. Waterworth said, the Translational Research for Injury Prevention Laboratory, or what's known on campus as the TRIP Lab. Mm -hmm. So that was established back in 2009, a little over a decade ago, and it's set up somewhat to operate like a research center in that research is our primary thrust, but we do a lot of training and outreach activities that I'll just touch upon here. Uh, but the focus of today's talk will be a lot about our research um, in this area. So we have been fortunate to receive funding for a, a variety of internal and external sources amounting to over $7 million. We've had a lot of training that's happened and many public health students, in fact, who have completed their internships at the TRIP Lab or have volunteered as undergraduate or graduate research assistants. And we have an outreach arm through a community partnership with the Regional Planning Commission of Greater Birmingham, where we have taken our research findings and translated them into uh, awareness prevention programs that are taken into high, area high schools and high schools across the states. So we've seen over 10,000 students through that means. And so the overarching goal of our research program at the TRIP Lab, again, is to really reduce the morbidity and mortality resulting from transportation related injuries. And we do that in two ways. One is investigating the risk and protective factors for motor vehicle crashes. And then second, translating those findings into evidence-based interventions with paying uh, particular attention to at-risk vulnerable populations that I'll discuss here on this slide. So this will give you a broad overview of our overarching research goals. So we are studying things at the intersection of transportation safety and behavior. As a developmental psychologist, one of my um, particular areas of interest is understanding what factors um, are involved for drivers across the lifespan. Two at-risk groups are the teen drivers out there who are the most inexperienced drivers on our roadway and older drivers who uh, lose particular skills and functioning that increase their risks on the road. So in this particular area, I have an NIH funded R01. It's a longitudinal study that's examining distracted driving in um, 220 teens over the first 18 months of their independent driving. I'll talk a bit about that today. 
We're also doing some work in autonomous driving across the lifespan. So this um, self-driving vehicles and some of the psychological perspectives related to that. I won't be talking about some of these other areas, but I wanna just give you a taste of the other topics uh, that we are exploring in the TRIP lab. So developmental disabilities is also one of our major thrusts. There are um, particular vulnerable at-risk groups who have for what, a variety of reasons are not licensed and have barriers to licensure and transportation. And that would include um, individuals with autism spectrum disorders individuals with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so we're studying some of the factors related to licensure and how we can promote licensure and safe driving for those particular at-risk groups. Because we're here um, just blocks away from the um, Academic Medical Center, we have a lot of interest from clinicians about whether their patients can safely return to drive or when they can safely return to drive. And so that's another major focus of our work. And I'll talk a bit more today about another R01 project that we're just launching that's looking at fitness to drive after mild traumatic brain injury among teen drivers. We've also done some work with um, create, using our driving simulator to create driving assessments to help clinicians understand what are some of the diff driving difficulties their patients have and helping provide more of an objective uh, decision-making tool with regard to return to drive. For example, individuals with severe to moderate TBIs, individuals who've had a stroke, or we've also uh, partnered quite a bit, collaborated with orthopedics to understand driving after a variety of orthopedic injuries that can affect driving. And then finally, another area that I won't discuss beyond this slide, but wanted you to know about is some exciting work that my postdoc, Dr. Benjamin McManus is undertaking. He was recently awarded a K01 from CDC wow. to um, continue his work looking at sleep, fatigue and stress and their impact on workers. In particular, he's studying this in medical residents and the impact of these factors on drowsy driving and increasing risks for workers who are uh, working shifts, uh, rotating shifts or working very long, grueling hours and then driving home um, at potentially increased risk um, coming off of their, their long shifts. And so it's some interesting work that's happening there as well. So the primary means for studying this uh, in our lab is using a driving simulator. And so here, uh, this driving simulator facility is here at UAB. It was established in 2016, thanks to a donation, very generous donation from Honda Manufacturing of Alabama. So the Honda Pilot that you see here is actually built in Lincoln, Alabama, and was donated to my lab. And then with additional funds from a grant from the Alabama Department of Transportation, we were able to build this state-of-the-art driving simulator facility. It's, um, there's about 20 of these across the world. We're the first and only SUV simulator in the world. And so um, it has enabled us to examine some important research questions in a safe and ethical manner because it doesn't actually go on the road, but instead drivers undergo challenging situations and we can understand their behavior and their responses to these situations, again, in the lab in, an, in a very immersive environment. And we were very fortunate when the driving simulator arrived to UAB, it got quite a bit of press. And so the Today Show actually um, did a live segment from our lab and CNN visited us that summer and did a documentary on distracted driving. And we use simulation because it's an excellent um, approach and methodology for understanding driving behavior. Again, because it's safe, you can stop the scenarios at any time. Participants um, are not at danger of injury from crashes because it's not out on the real road. The scenarios are repeatable. Um, in other words, we can give, they can be given, participants can be given the same scenarios or the same situations multiple times and we can understand driving behavior in those ways. And it provides us an easy way of data capture because all of the data are electronically recorded by the simulator. And so they're already stored on the computer and we're able to then do some post-processing to um, achieve um, particular measurable outcomes of interest. So a little bit more about our simulator. Again, it's a 2016 Honda Pilot. It's considered a high fidelity driving simulator. It's very immersive. And so in simulation, um, you can have low fidelity simulators. You may have seen some of these that are simply a PC 
desktop computer with a single screen and you might use a keyboard to navigate or you may have a um, additional steering wheel and brake and pedal that's mounted onto a desk that you can use so that would be considered more of a low fidelity driving simulator and then the higher fidelity simulators like the one you see here include a um, larger field of view so we have three projection screens that are in front of our driver um, it includes a full vehicle cab so it's very immersive and feels realistic to the driver and in fact the inside of the vehicle is completely preserved so it looks just like the 2016 honda pilots that are on the market it has a fully functional throttle brake your selector the original steering wheel turn signals the dashboard and we're able to collect data as those uh, particular features are used in the simulator it's lifted off the ground so that the participant experiences a normal ride height it is on a motion-based system so it provides pitch cues to our driver. So as they accelerate or brake, the simulator moves. And so it provides some feedback to them, which also helps us reduce simulator sickness rates. And I talked a bit about the projection screens, which are very important for us as we're understanding driving attention. And that's one of the particular areas of interest in our lab. So it's important for us to be able to capture that full field of view through the projection screens in front of the driver. But we also have side mirrors that have um, LCD displays. I don't know if you can see in the, in the picture here, but it simulates traffic uh, behind the driver. And there's actually a projection screen behind them. So when they look in the rear view mirror, they can see what's going on behind. And so the data are electronically recorded and we can get a whole host of variables. Here's some of the core variables that we typically use in our studies to answer important questions, but we can get so much more um, because it's a very powerful system and it collects data at 60 Hertz. So we're getting very fine grained driver behavior information along the way. And we've also integrated a few um, additional systems to expand the scope of our capabilities. So one is an eye tracking system that you see here on the left. And on the right is a biopack system which collects uh, psychophysiological measurements such as skin conductance and heart rate variability. And so our eye trackers uh, are mounted on the dash of the simulator and they track the gaze direction and head position and eyelid openings of our participants. And we're able to then track where they're looking, how long they're looking there, and perhaps why they're looking at particular objects in the simulated environment. Okay, so now I will turn and tell you about a couple of our ongoing research projects at UAB. The first one is known as REACT. Uh, we like acronyms in our lab, so all of our projects have acronyms, and REACT stands for Roadway Experience and Attentional Change in Teens. And so this was an R01 funded longitudinal study by NICHD, and it's currently in its fourth year. So the main impetus for this study was trying to parse out the effects of age and experience on crash risk. Most prior studies in this area with teen drivers have confounded age and experience. And so we set out to design a study where we would be able to parse out those effects. Some, the graph that you see here, so some prior work suggests that young age is a strong predictor of motor vehicle crash risk. And it's those, some of those studies are confounded though, because those are also the inexperienced drivers on the road. Mm -hmm. There are some studies that suggest though that older novices still have increased risks, maybe not as high as young, dry, young novices, but they still show higher risks. And we know that the risk plateaus out at around 18 months, that's around the red arrow that you see here. Um, so there's very high crash rates early on in the first months of independent licensure, and those risks come down dramatically until they plateau at about 18 months out, but that's a very long time. And so scientists are trying to understand what do drivers learn in that 18 months and at what pace do they learn those things so we can accelerate teen driver learning in an effort to reduce those terrible losses that I was talking about earlier on, the motor vehicle crashes that happen in that long period of time. And so the conceptual framework for this study focuses on Michon's model of driving. And so essentially there are various levels to driving. And here at the bottom, level one, the basic cognitive abilities that one has um, that are needed to drive safely. So this would be things like your reaction time, visuospatial reasoning, motor coordination, some basic skills that you have. And then 
these skills become more sophisticated as you move up levels that are required for driving up to the top level, level four here, strategic abilities that are needed for driving because driving is a goal oriented, purposeful um, task. And so you need to be able to coordinate strategically certain processes in order to do it effectively and safely. And so building on this idea, driving as a cognitively challenging task, our lab has spent quite a bit of work understanding what neuropsychological functions, so on a brain level, what kinds of functions map onto these specific driving tasks. So when you think about it, we may take it for granted because many of us in the room today have been drivers for a long time. So driving has become quite automatic for us. Uh, but for a teen driver who doesn't have as much experience, when they get into a vehicle, it's very effortful for them uh, to remember all of the things they need to do to navigate safely. So for example, we get in, we buckle up, hopefully. Uh, we check our mirrors and we do that automatically and we start our car and we put it in drive and we take off for the day and we know where we're going. But for a team, they actually have to think through all of those steps. It's very has to be very effortful for them. They also need to do things like attend to the road properly, monitor their speed, anticipate or predict hazards on the road. So these are higher level strategic kinds of tasks that happen on the roadway that again, are automatic or easier for experienced drivers, but may not be for our inexperienced teams. And these happen to relate to general neuropsychological functions like general attention, being able to coordinate processes known as the executive function of the brain, so the CEO of your brain that is responsible for the school oriented behavior. And we have found associations between these neuropsych functions and these individual driving tasks in a series of studies that we've conducted. But attention seems to be one of the most important um, tasks or I'd say features of driving safely. And we know that for adolescents, their attentional skills are still actually undergoing quite significant development as their brains are still developing rapidly, especially in particular, this executive control of attention in adolescence and beyond. And novice drivers may not actually know how to deploy their attentional skills in the novel task of driving. So that's what this study is trying to understand further. And some of our pilot data definitely suggests that younger drivers demonstrate less effective driving attention as compared to middle-aged or older drivers, as you see here. We're looking at percent of time that drivers spent looking off of the forward roadway. So in other words, being distracted by external things to driving, such as billboards in this particular study. So our teen drivers spent more time looking at billboards that were irrelevant to the driving task as compared to younger, or excuse me, as compared to older drivers in the study, more experienced drivers. And some of our pilot work has suggested that driving attention changes quite rapidly over a short amount of time where we see teen drivers in a baseline condition <clears throat> glancing off of the forward roadway significantly more than at six weeks later. So we do see some improvements in driving in particular driving attention over a short amount of time. So in REACT, in our longitudinal study, we are aiming to, again, parse out the effects of age or development as, a, as compared to experience on driving attention development. Understanding the role of underlying cognitive mechanisms in that driving attention development. So what is the role of the executive function, speed of processing and attentional control? And then ultimately being able to understand what effect that driving attention development has on real world driving behavior and driving outcomes. And so we will look at drive, the driving simulator, but we're also collecting information through state reported crash records to understand um, what impact driving attention has on crash outcomes. And so we have a two by two factorial design built into our longitudinal study to be able to parse out the effects of age and experience. So with respect to experience, we recruit drivers who are licensed versus non-licensed. And we are enrolling them within two weeks of licensure if they are licensed. So we catch them from their first two weeks of independent driving and we track them over 18 months, that critical period that I talked about earlier. Non-licensed, these are folks who say, 
I'm not licensed and I don't plan to be over the next 18 months. Of course, some may inadvertently get licensed and we don't hold people back from doing that, but their intention at, upon enrollment is to not get licensed. So that we can look at the difference between experienced and not experienced. And for the differences between age, we recruit at 16 versus 18. And they come in for seven appointments. So that comes out to about once every three months. When they're with us, they go undergo an extensive neurocognitive battery, as well as drive in our simulator under varying levels of distraction, because we're interested in particular how the driving attention development changes under varying levels of cognitive load. So we distract them by talking to them on a cell phone and asking them to engage in a texting interaction while they're driving. And in between these three month appointments, we also collect information about driving exposure and continued experience. And so they self-report, but also provide odometer readings on their, their primary vehicle. Um, and they also complete some other surveys about other psychosocial factors that may be related to driving. When they're driving in our simulator, again, we track their visual attention and we have programmed particular hazards they don't know these are hazards at the time, but we, we have hazards that appear that they could anticipate um, or possibly predict as something being a critical event. And we test whether they produce an evasive maneuver to avoid collision with those hazards. And so here I'm showing some of our pilot data from React. Again, we're looking at visual attention. So what you see here is our participant, this is from the perspective of our, our participant driver going through one of our driving simulations. And the green circle that you see in the middle of the screen actually represents the participant's gaze. Um, so you can see where they are looking as they navigate through this scenario. And this is an example from an inexperienced driver, which as you may be able to tell, the green circle tends to focus straight ahead on the roadway and not doing much horizontal scanning across the environment. Mm -hmm. And that's what we commonly see in cross-sectional studies, looking at driving attention, uh, differences between novice and experienced drivers. What we're hoping to see is that, uh, and being able to identify, how does that change? How does that variability engage change across development over those 18 months of driving? Since we know that they are particularly at high risk early on. So this is just replaying the video because I, what I would like you also to notice is that as the driver is steering just straight ahead of them, they tend to miss a lot of important information that's available in the periphery. As experienced drivers, we scan the horizontal area looking and anticipating hazards. For example, through this intersection, as a vehicle comes through and possibly doesn't stop. But our inexperienced driver didn't even notice that hazard, just kept driving and looking straight ahead. Mm -hmm. That's in contrast to here, an experienced driver, same scenario, but you can see that this driver tends to show much more efficient scanning behavior. And so we see they're scanning across the horizontal um, environment here and noticing things like pedestrians and other objects that are coming through the scene. And in this particular intersection, they spotted the hazard and they did notice it. And then you might have noticed if, if you did that there was a swerving behavior that happened there through that intersection. So we've learned a lot through our experience with React and that it, one thing that we possibly um, didn't anticipate was the vast amount of data that we are producing with the study. And so participants, you know, we said that we have over 200 participants, they drive three times every time they come in across seven appointments. So we're left with, you know, nearly 1500 driving files that need to be analyzed. And so we've been collaborating with computer engineers at UAB to help provide a solution uh, for this coding. What happens typically in our field is that a lot of this eye tracking is coded manually. So in other words, trained research assistants go through frame by frame to determine whether a driver looked at a particular region of interest in the environment. We're working with computer engineering to develop deep learning algorithms that then can read and understand, these programs have been trained to understand whether the object of interest is, a, is in a particular frame, and then it annotates it with a box around like this, and so it can automatically be coded for us. And we've just published a paper, um, my computer engineer in our lab, Piyush Pawar, just published a 
paper suggesting why this methodology is uh, superior to manual coding. And the main uh, driving factor for this is efficiency and time. So we started out with manual coding in my lab with a team of research assistants and they were taking about 90 seconds per frame because you have to draw this box very accurately in particular at size and then click to the next frame and you have to start the box over and draw a five point box again and repeat this process frame by frame across 1500 files. So it's extremely time consuming. So what takes a manual coder about 90 seconds takes the computer about six seconds per frame. And so the time savings is huge cost savings for researchers is huge. And so um, that's been a, a huge undertaking in our lab, but ultimately we'll be able to extract from this information, gaze behavior, glances. So how many times participants looked at a, a particular hazard and how long they looked at it, because those are particular um, outcomes of interest to our study. So what are some of the potential implications of this work? So again, we're comparing age versus experience. So if we find that age to, tends to be more important for driving attention development than experience, then the implication could be that delayed licensure may be um, something to consider because currently, of course, in the United States, we license at 16 across, there's some variability across states. Uh, here in Alabama at 16, that drivers can be independent drivers. They are under graduated driver's licensing restrictions. However, they can drive on their own without a, a parent or a guardian in their vehicle. So if we find that simply they are too young cognitively to handle the cognitively demanding task of driving, then this may give some evidence or support for a delayed licensure. On the other hand, if we find that experience outweighs age or development, then perhaps one potential implication is driving exposure. How can we capitalize on the pre-driver experience? So in other words, the learning to drive period. So currently in Alabama, driver's education is not mandatory. And so um, parents can sign off that they have driven with their teen for 30 hours, and then they can um, take their driver's test and get a license. So is 30 hours enough practice uh, before they become independent drivers. Not sure, the 30 hours isn't really based on any uh, prior studies or prior work. And also 30 hours could be practicing in the same environment under the same ideal conditions, maybe to school or to a, a local grocery store or something like that every day, the same route. And so going back to our conceptual framework, it's important that drivers get practice diversity so in other words, practicing driving in gradually more difficult situations with a supervisor, with a parent in the vehicle so that they can protect them and provide some guidance and offer real-time feedback as they navigate through those before they're on their own driving independently. Those are some of the ideas we're thinking about. And potent, another potential implication in looking at these neurocognitive processes and what role they play we're interested in whether cognitive interventions uh, might also be able to accelerate teen driver learning. And here I show a screenshot from uh, a task that was actually developed by one of my colleagues here at UAB, Dr. Carlene Ball, the useful field of <laughs> view test, which has now uh, been turned into a game, a cognitive training game. And it helps to, uh, actually there's uh, quite a bit of support that suggests that training on this speed of processing program can reduce older driver crash risk significantly. Now, whether that would work for teen drivers, that remains to be um, tested or examined at this point, but that is something also that we are considering as we move forward and understand what cognitive mechanisms are at play in, in the developmental trajectories of these young drivers. Okay, so switching gears here, um, our, our second R01 that is just launching is called R2 Drive, Return to Drive After Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. This is in collaboration with Ohio State University and Nationwide Children's. Uh, so it's a multi-site longitudinal study that is addressing two important public health problems in teens. So I've talked already today about teen driving and why that's important. Teen drivers have the highest crash rates of all age groups. They're still learning this complex task of driving. Also, when we talk about mild traumatic brain injury, or I might use synonymously here, concussion, 
um, teens are at a higher risk for concussion and concussions can have detrimental impacts on teen brains, causing them symptoms that often persist for quite a while. And so um, one important question that has not yet been considered is when can teens safely return to drive after a concussion? And what's interesting is there are formal protocols in place. Well, I'll say there are protocols in place in Canada and Australia about when a, when a teen can return to drive. They aren't really based on any empirical evidence. In the US, there are no formal protocols regarding driving after a concussion. There are formal protocols about when you can return to play. A lot of these concussions happen for athletes. Uh, when those athletes can return to school. So they're called return to think protocols. But again, no, no formal protocols on return to drive. And when we've discussed this idea with clinicians, they said, we'd love to have some, some evidence-based um, tools to provide our patients with, you know, and, and helping them make some important decisions about their lives. So that is what we set out to do here in this particular study. So we're looking at how does driving change over time, so acutely post-injury, and that's what makes the study pretty innovative. No one has ever, um, to our knowledge, enrolled teens after a concussion within 96 hours of their injury. So we're gonna see them immediately following their injury, and we're gonna track them until symptom resolution. And we will have weekly assessments in our driving simulator to understand how their driving changes over time. Here, we're also interested in those underlying cognitive mechanisms. The neuropsych testing will include reaction time and processing speed and visual and verbal memory, all things that we know TBIs can have impact on and that are related to driving in prior cross-sectional work. And then finally, some of our pilot work suggested that um, teen drivers acutely post-injury showed the most performance decrements under high levels of cognitive load. So the effects of that TBI on their driving was somewhat subtle when we put them under ideal conditions. So just driving through typical, uh, normal, great driving conditions, daytime, light traffic. But when we increased traffic density and presented them with some more challenging situations, like having them multitask while driving, um, and just talking to a passenger in the vehicle in this case, those effects, the driving differences were um, much more apparent compared to matched healthy controls. So we're interested in looking at that a bit further as well. So this is our general design for the study. It's a multi-site study. We're working with Ohio State because they happen to have the same simulator as us. And so that's allowed for uh, multi-site data collection. They have an Acura for the shell, but it actually runs the same scenarios as the ones that we run here. So we're able to share the software and the scenarios that are developed across sites and collect data that are sampled similarly across sites as well. So here at UAB, we're planning to recruit 100 teen drivers in total. Half of those will have sustained a mild traumatic brain injury. And half will be matched controls. We recruit again acutely post-injury and then we follow them in through weekly assessments until symptom resolution. And so as you see, our, our sample size comes down quite a bit because we do know based on some pilot work by our colleagues that symptoms typically resolve within one month for three quarters of people who have sustained a TBI, a mild TBI. So about a month out, three quarters of our sample will have symptoms resolved, but we will continue to track those who have continued persistent symptoms. And we also have daily surveys of their real world driving we ask them, did you drive today? What was the purpose of that drive? Where did you go? How long did you go? So we can understand when are drivers returning after a mild traumatic brain injury. This did not set out to be a sports study, but I alluded to this that one common way teens sustain a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury is by sports. And so that's we have um, designed our recruitment strategies around that idea. Uh, so we're working closely with athletic trainers because they're on the sidelines. They know when uh, their players have sustained a concussion and they alert us at time of concussion so that we can cut down on enrollment time because we wanna see um, these kiddos 
shortly after their concussion so that we can track them when symptoms are at their worst um, and on until symptom resolution. And so we're partnering with um, a variety of sports teams in the area. We also have on board the head team physician for University of Alabama sports, uh, Dr. Jimmy Robinson, who's helping with also identifying and sending patients our way. So um, soon, hopefully you'll see some of our flyers. That means we're doing a good job of advertising the study. We're not just recruiting athletes for the study, but again, that'll be, I think, uh, fruitful for us, especially in fall with football coming back um, in full speed and that our, our team physicians that are on this particular project said fall, they're expecting fall to be quite busy after people have taken a break from sports due to COVID and there's a lot of people eager to get back in. So it's kind of a, a bad problem. We're not wishing concussions on anyone, but we think our recruitment will take off uh, this fall. So that's what we're looking at for launching. What potential impact can this have? So again, we will be the first to ever systematically examine and provide some evidence on when teens can safely return to drive after a mild traumatic brain injury. Turn knowledge has never been any studies looking at this. Um, we hope to be able to inform the development of clinical practice guidelines. Um, and ultimately we're interested in working with clinicians to build an online tool that can help them make informed decisions on when their patients can return to drive safely. Currently, they prescribe cognitive rest, but it's, it's vague that way, and it, they don't specifically say, this is what cognitive rest means, don't drive. <laughs> and so um, that's, that's something also important that we want to increase awareness about moving forward. Because it looks like I have a, a few minutes here, I will touch on um, some other related activities in our lab. So Autospan, we're interested in autonomous driving, as we know that uh, technology in this area continues to advance rapidly, and there are a number of psychological constructs of importance here in understanding things like, will, will people actually trust the machine to drive them? Uh, will they accept technology to serve this role in their lives? There are enormous implications for teen drivers in the learning to drive process, not just for teens, but for all of us learning to drive uh, with this new technology. And because we have a history of cognitive development research, we think we can play an important role here in understanding what are the cognitive predictors of takeover when the vehicle malfunctions. And so um, many might say, well, self-driving vehicles are you know, far, far away, probably won't see it in our lifetime. Uh, we already have some of these adaptive driving assistance systems available. Some mm -hmm. of your own cars may already have these things. So um, they're, they're rated, as you can see in this figure across the bottom from zero. So vehicles who have, that have no automation, manual control, the human performs all of the tasks, all the way up to what you're thinking, futuristic self-driving vehicles where you get in, the vehicle performs all of the driving tasks and the human has, has to provide no attention at all. They, you can get in and take a nap. We're, we are far away from five, but currently on the road, we have two, two is available. And many of you may have these um, ADAS symptoms, uh, ADAS systems, as I mentioned. So this would be like forward collision warning, lane departure systems, mm -hmm. uh, park assist, so if you have any of those kinds of features on your car, you have a, a vehicle that with an SAE level two is what it's known as. Um, they're starting to look at SAE level three. So in other words, the vehicle performs most of the driving tasks, but human override is still required. So in other words, stay attentive, keep your hands on, your, on the wheel. And you can see they show in the graphic with the, the driver with their hands on the wheel. Uh, because if something goes wrong, you would need to be prepared to be able to take, take over the vehicle. And so that's, that's the level that we're currently interested in understanding further and how people can do that. So we're running a pilot study currently at UAB that involves 48 parent teen dyads. We have teens ages 14 to 17 coming in. We went the younger age group here because we thought if the car drives itself, could a 14 year old, a pre-driver, navigate and what are some of the issues surrounding that? What, how would parents feel about that? Um, 
And so we, they take independent drives, meaning we put the teen in to the sim and it drives autonomously. We put the parent in the sim, it drives autonomously. We don't tell them this, but the technology malfunctions at some point and it requires them to take over the vehicle. In a practice drive, we kind of show them the features of, if you need to take over, this is how you would do this. So they've been trained to take over. They don't realize that's gonna actually happen during the study. So they both experienced a vehicle malfunction independently. Then we bring them back into the vehicle together as a dyad with the teen in the driver's seat and the parent in the passenger seat. We have them take a second drive together. We don't tell them, but we have another malfunction that happens that requires takeover. And we actually video record that interaction to see um, how the parent coaches or whether the parent coaches the teen through the situation. And so I have a, I have a video clip to show you some of uh, one particular drive that we got to show here. Hopefully it'll play. In the self-driving system on, please know, you may turn the self-driving system off at any time in a few minutes too. You may start the drive now. Um, there was, oh, there was somebody like stopped. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did you take over without taking it off of self control? Yes, I had to. I was going to hit it. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I just sat there like this. <laughs> <laughs> and the car, and the car actually went around it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's crazy. There's a lot of KFCs. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, the whole time I was like looking down at the speed to make sure there was no the speed limit. Like I just had very little confidence or trust, even though as, as I got more comfortable with it. Are you even paying attention, or do you feel like a passenger? <laughs> Did you say that in your survey? Well, no, How alert are you right now? Very alert. I'm just tired today. What? It's like a little hot to look up right now. Stop. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah. I just do nothing. Well, it depends on your comfort level. How do you feel? I'll see you what it does. That's what I did the first time. It actually went around it. What? And it does it like perfectly. It does it a lot different than when I would do it. I'm, I'm, I'm doing 55. I know. I know. I know. Let's just see what it does. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You're going to have to. Oh. <laughs> see? That's crazy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, I don't. Mm -mm. When I had my self drive, are you going to drive at all? What are you doing now? Oh, yeah, Is it self drive? Self -drive. Okay. When, when that it happened to me, when it, that happened to me, it actually like corrected itself. It's not correct. But it also corrected it like a lot sooner. So. I was yeah, you did. You knew that. That was terrible. <laughs> See, and I don't, I just, when I'm not in control, it really stresses me out. But there That's were a few times. Around it, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And it's supposed to slow down before it comes to, I know, but you're trying to trust it that it knows what it's doing. It didn't go. Which makes me, gives me anxiety. Because you, if you're going to allow something to take over control, you want 100% trust it's going to do what it's supposed to do. If there's a slight percentage that it's not, then I don't want it. I don't want any part of it. All right. So you could hear in that um, quite a few interesting ideas that we want to move forward on and understanding trust. We heard a lot of trust coming on, uh, coming up in the conversation. So I actually have a graduate student who is using 
the qualitative data there for her dissertation project to understand how parents react. Um, we've had some a variety of interactions so far, some more dramatic screams, uh, cuss words, <laughs> things happening during the vehicle malfunction. This was one of uh, one that was kind of interesting to me because it brought up again the trust issue and will people be able to actually trust uh, the vehicle and and what will their acceptance of the vehicle and the machine actually be? And so that's some of the things that we want to do in a follow-up study. So we're collaborating with Auburn University on this one. Auburn has um, at the GAV lab a fully autonomous Lincoln MKZ. It's in their engineering department. And so we are partnering with Barber here in, here in Birmingham to actually do some of this simulator experimental work enhancing it by doing some field testing. So on their track, so they've permitted us to take the MKZ on the track. We're actually going to have cardboard hazards, as you can see here in the lower left, um, that pop up as sensors as our, as our uh, driver navigates through with a self-driving vehicle, but the vehicle will fail to respond to one of the hazards like we've done in the simulator. And we will look at how the teen actually takes control of the MKZ. So how long it takes them to take control, how they take control. And we're also going to include some eye tracking uh, metrics to see how did they anticipate, were they looking at the hazard at the time of the malfunction. So we're excited about that work. Um, because it's a public health audience, I thought you also might be interested in knowing a little bit more about our community outreach distracted driving program. Yes. And so um, we have a couple of initiatives. One is a summer science workshop that we host. We took one year off uh, due to COVID last summer, but we invite rising high school seniors to come in and they spend two weeks in our lab going through what we call a science of distracted driving workshop. Uh, where participants are able to work in groups and create projects that are related to distracted driving. They use the driving simulator to collect data. So you might think of it as sort of a, a research methods course on steroids. So they go through in, in two weeks time. Uh, their families are invited on the last day and they present their poster. Um, and so it's an exciting way to get students sort of interested in science and transportation and also learn safe driving tips along the way. And then we also have our virtual trip lab program. This is the outreach program that we go out into schools. So it was, it was in person COVID. We pivoted and created a virtual program which allowed us to expand uh, our reach across the state. But we are back and doing in persons hopefully this fall. Uh, we're scheduling now with schools. We have a portable driving simulator. So we take it into the schools. We present a short, not PowerPoint, but sort of a presentation to students to increase their awareness about distracted driving. And then we allow them to engage with the driving simulator and test out distracted driving themselves. Because many will say, I'm a great multitasker. And then we have them do that. We record it, we play back. And they are usually appalled at like, no way, that's me. And you can see the car swerving across the road as they were attempting to text, for example, with a friend in the classroom. Um, so since we pivoted to virtual, <laughs> we created a, vi a video series showing teen drivers um, some real life examples of driving situations. And it, a comp uh, there's some supplemental materials for teachers. These are mainly being delivered to drivers education classrooms across the state, although they're on available on YouTube and freely and accessible to you all. Here's a short one. So they're a very short clips. This will just give you a sense. And this is a public health um, student actually that is an MP, one of your MPH students who works in my lab, Annika Abrams. <laughs> Sam. And I'm Annika. And we're researchers here at the UAB Trip Lab. Now you might be asking, what's a trip lab? Well, TRIP or TRIP stands for Translational Research for Injury Prevention. Basically, we're a team of researchers here at UAB committed to gaining a better understanding of the psychological aspects of transportation related injuries. We use technology to study distracted driving. 
let me show you. UAB has the first and only SUV driving simulator. And we use the state of the art lab to gain knowledge about how your attention to the road can help or hurt your driving. Teens and new drivers are especially vulnerable to the risks that come with driving, making it the most common reason for injury and death in teenagers. Combine that with how integrated technology, social media, and online connectedness is in our lives, and you have a recipe for disaster out on the road. Through our partnership with the Regional Planning Commission of Greater Birmingham, we aim to bring research and expertise on distracted driving directly to you. In this series, you're going to learn more about distracted driving, the risks it imposes, and how to make better decisions next time you hit the road. Our goal is to make you a better and safer driver. And the next module will cover different types of distractions and which ones are the most dangerous. Okay, so I just gave you a little taste of that. There are six videos and I'm happy to share the link if anybody's interested and wants to take a look or share them with teens in your lives or parents in your lives. We'd be happy for you to spread the information. Um, as much as possible. So I noticed I've just got a couple minutes left. So I wanted to take a minute to just acknowledge the hardworking students in my lab. Their picture here, we've been meeting via Zoom as I'm sure all of you have as well. Yes, no. Zoomed out here. Um, and at the bottom here, uh, acknowledging my current funding sponsors, NIH and RPC. Mm -hmm.